Uh, my name is Victoria, both your PhD in Michael's lab. And um, the title of my thesis is Theoretical Foundations and Applications in the Learning Architectures for Graphs. So graph neural networks, or GNNs for short, enable the modeling of uh, complex systems or in like data sets, where the relationships between the data points are a crucial part of the data set itself. They're designed to process graph structured data um, and find applications in fields such as drug discovery, genomics, uh, cybersecurity, and um, recommended systems and social networks. And they do so by finding patterns um, in the relationships among data points. So on a high level, uh, graphs represent interconnected networks consisting of nodes and edges. Um, each node in the graph represents an agent or an object and has a set of attributes. And um, edges represents the relationship between um, sets, like between pairs of these nodes. Um, and uh, like these nodes, they can also have feature vectors associated to them uh, that describe uh, the relationship. So for example, the strength of a social connection or a chemical bond. Um, nodes can be connected by any number of edges. And uh, formally, a graph is defined by a set of nodes V and a set of edges V. Uh, a GNN then leverages the node features and the structural information encoded by the edges to learn how to propagate information across the graph most effectively. Um, the, this capability allows graph neural networks to perform tasks such as a node classification or a link prediction. Uh, before we dive into more technical details, um, let's go through uh, how uh, what GNNs are and how they work. A graph neural network will iterati iteratively update um, node embeddings in the graph. So during each message passing iteration, a hidden embedding H corresponding to a node U uh, will be updated according to the information aggregated from that node's graph in the hood. Um, this update can be uh, expressed as displayed here, where update and aggregate are arbitrarily differentiable functions. Most commonly, they are MLPs. Uh, it might be important to note that um, in a graph neural network, uh, the nodes in the graph um, are the data samples itself, themselves. So if we use mini batches, for example, for gradient descent, um, then uh, we're actually processing a subgraph within the whole data set, therefore actually cutting some of the edges that would be connecting that subgraph to the rest of the data set. Um, so because GNNs are a rather young architectural type, um, they come with some unique limitations. Uh, Oversmoothing, for example, um, occurs when a model excessively aggregates information um, from the neighbors, from the neighboring nodes over multiple layers, leading to a loss of discriminative features and um, just like a blurring of the node representations. Uh, further, oops, okay. There we go. Uh, further, graph neural networks are uh, rather unstable. Uh, so even small perturbations like um, adding a node or removing an edge or even just small perturbations within the node features themselves can lead to drastically different outcomes. Uh, the research community has favored uh, transductive learning settings, um, in which case the uh, test nodes are part of the training data set. Um, of course, without the labels, but that, in, that encourages the graph or the model um, to uh, to learn um, data-specific representations rather than overall rules, and therefore uh, it limits its ability to generalize to new and unseen graphs. And last but not least, which is a common problem for a lot of deep learning models, um, they kind of look up, behave like a black box in a quotation, and therefore the interpretability of the learned features uh, is rather limited. Of course, it's just a subset of the limitations, uh, but those are the ones that we will be discussing in the next 35-ish minutes. And more specifically, the objective of this thesis is to leverage insights from recurrent neural networks, variation autoencoders, and reinforcement learning um, to improve the generalizability, robustness, and applicability of graph neural networks. Okay, so um, I will be giving a more formal introduction um, when the respective networks um, come up throughout this talk. But on a high level, we will be covering recurrent neural networks, uh, which were designed for sequential data analysis, such as time series or natural language. Uh, variation autoencoders, which are which fall into the category of uh, generative unsupervised uh, learning um, and that can help sample new data that resembles the original one. And then we have reinforcement learning, which um, as a deep learning approach to sequential decision making uh, that relies on directly interacting with a given environment. So here's the outline of this presentation. Um, 
After listing my four main contributions, I will dive into each of them individually. Uh, namely, I uh, will be covering the generalization ability of graph neural networks. Then we'll be talk, oh, we will be talking about uh, the combination of graph neural networks with recurrent neural networks for dynamic graph analysis. Um, then graph neural networks with variation autoencoders for generative graph modeling. And finally, graph neural networks with reinforcement learning for uh, graph-based optimization solvers. Okay, so firstly, we'll delve into the theoretical aspects of graph neural networks, presenting analysis of their ability to uh, generalize and um, in introduce um, improved bounds on excess risk. Uh, this gives us insights into how genomes perform under various conditions um, and some guidance for their training. Uh, then we'll explore a combination of graph neural networks with recurrent neural networks to improve the analysis of spatial temporal data. Uh, we introduced two novel layer architectures um, that outperform traditional models on real world data sets. <laughs> Next, I will be talking uh, or demonstrating the integration of uh, graph neural networks with variational autoencoders, uh, specifically for the purpose of motion prediction. Uh, this approach not only captures the dynamics between interactive agents more effectively, um, but also enhances the model interpretability and its ability to generalize to out of distribution uh, scenarios. And lastly, uh, we'll be covering graph neural networks in the context of reinforcement learning um, to address coverage optimization tasks. Okay, so in summary, uh, this research presents a multifaceted enhancement of graph neural networks uh, from theoretical understanding to practical applications across various domains. Let's jump into the first contribution. Specifically, we would arrive a generalized approach to bounding excess risk in GNNs. Uh, we'll be introducing the generalization gap and how it can be bounded by the raw macro complexity. And then I'll be introducing the size independent bound that we derived and where we can go from there. So generalization complexity refers to the measure of um, how well a machine learning model training a specific data set uh, performs on um, unseen data. So this means converging to H hat rather than uh, like the optimal H star. And we can bound this quantity as is displayed here. And then following a statistical theorem from I think 2010, uh, this term can be bounded by the Rademacher complexity, which quantifies the model's ability to generalize and to avoid overfitting. For completeness, I've added the formula for the Rademacher complexity here, but there is no need to actually remember it for the subsequent slides. Um, we present a seminal theorem um, for size independent generalization bound. So given a graph neural network um, that has uh, with weight matrix <coughs> where all the matri ma weight matrices in the graph are bounded, as in um, their um, the matrix norms are bounded, and the activation functions are all um, pointwise one Lipschitz. Um, then, which the most common ones like ReLU, TANH, SoftMax, and so on, they are, um, then the whole graph neural network can be considered Lipschitz continuous with a bounded constant, which we know tiers capital M. And um, it's a product of um, each layer's constant. Uh, then we derive an upper bound on the Rada macro complexity. Here, capital M, again, is the upper bound on the Lipschitz constant for the whole graph neural network. Capital V is the bound on the input features, and lowercase m is um, the number of samples, and in our case, it will be the size of the graph. Now, we could point out that capital M is um, technically implicitly dependent on network depth, as it um, is an upper bound on the product of each layer. Um, however, in our paper, we proved that a model that satisfies our outline conditions uh, will converge to a certain point, no matter the number of layers. And actually, um, given a specific initialization, we can guarantee optimal convergence. So we compare our contributions uh, with existing bounds in the GNN literature. Uh, we note that we have um, an improved scalability with uh, network depth uh, with max no degree, which is particularly important for graphs with large hubs and for uh, and with the number of nodes to the size of the graph itself. These experiments are only exemplary tasks to provide empirical evidence. Um, usually we do not know the maximum likelihood estimate, so like the optimal model um, H star of uh, the model that we are trying to optimize. 
Um, but we do note that a model of performance in graph regression, as well as node classification, does converge actually optimally in this case. Um, and we also note that the uh, bound on uh, classification tasks, um, sorry, on regression is much tighter than the one on classification, uh, which can be attributed at least in part to the discreteness of the prediction space. So to summarize, um, we are exploring a GNN's ability um, to generalize by bounding excess risks and achieve a size independent bound um, under additional norm constraints of the parameter matrices. Um, our derivations are adaptable to different uh, layer types and, um, and loss functions, uh, but they do require um, bounded norms. Uh, the optimal convergence does require um, the GNN layers to be um, normalized. And yeah, so, and lastly, like the empirical evidence that we have um, to support our theoretical findings, um, they're only, but like they're, they were done on like specific data sets and um, graphical networks configurations. So there is definitely some need for uh, more experiments on more diverse data sets. Uh, the next contribution revolves around combining graphs of recurrent neural networks for spatial temporal uh, reasoning. Traditionally, these are arranged sequentially. So we have a GNN block followed by an RNN um, or vice versa. Um, and here we actually introduce uh, two new layer architectures that, in, uh, that combine these two models um, by embedding one network within the other, resulting in like a more integrated representation of temporal dynamics alongside um, like spatial representations. And uh, this, for example, shows how a GNN can be embedded in the gating mechanism of a GRU or a gated recurrent unit, which this is a gated recurrent unit without the GNN. Um, so RNNs, recurrent neural networks, are designed for sequential data analysis, such as time series or natural language. Uh, and they do so by maintaining an internal state that captures previous inputs. Um, a common drawback of traditional recurrent neural networks is the vanishing gradient problem, uh, which limits recognizing long range dependencies uh, within sequences. Um, to address this, among other layer types, uh, gated recurrent units were developed, um, which use a gated mechanism to regulate the information flow. And uh, they're composed of uh, four different gates. So we have the reset gate, reset gate uh, which determines how much of the previous memory to keep or discard. Uh, then we have the update gate, which determines how much of the hidden state to update with the new one. Um, then the new memory content, which combines the input XT with the previous hidden state, HT minus one. And then uh, we have the final hidden state, which is the output of the layer, but also becomes um, the new um, hidden state. So we set out to integrate a graph neural network with the negating mechanism of a GRU. Um, and we chose to embed the GNN in the new memory content gate, so the third one. Um, instead of using a linear layer uh, paired with a tan H activation, um, we introduce a GNN to handle the uh, spatial dynamics within a temporal processing. More specifically, we use actually a GCN uh, because it traditionally also has a tan H activation function. Okay, so I'm going to preemptively answer some questions. Why are we using GRUs? Um, that's because they have fewer parameters and like, for example, LSTMs and therefore train um, a little faster and are just more efficient. And uh, why are we introducing the GNN at the uh, new memory content gate? Um, the other option would have been the reset gate, which is right in the beginning. Um, so it would be the first gate, but that would lead to another sequential arrangement of GNN to RNN. Um, uh, well, technically, mathematically, it would uh, not be entirely equivalent because there is a nonlinear activation between the two. But um, yeah, so that's why. Okay, so, so far we have seen how to embed a GNN in a GRU, um, but we also propose and evaluate the opposite. So embedding a GRU within a graph neural network. But for the interest of time, um, I won't go into the detail of the specific architecture, but feel free to inquire about it later um, or refer to the method section of the respective paper. The first experiments, uh, experiment that we will be talking about to test our two architectures um, is actually a proprietary data set by Uber. We're interned over the summer. Um, 
the task at hand is to predict the additional uh, driver hours needed um, in different locations throughout a city. And in order to do that, uh, we are applying a hex grid and then split the city into like area clusters, kind of like this, uh, for which we're then predicting supply deficit. So the data set we are dealing with um, compiles six weeks worth of data, which is about a million data points. Um, and the input to the model would be uh, 50 hours, and then we predict the next 24, uh, 25 um, hours or time steps. Um, for completeness, I've added the, uh, the list of our features here and uh, the pre-processing that has been done. Uh, I won't go into any detail about it, but it's basically an 18-dimensional feature space. So our research compares several predictive architectures. Uh, we have two naive approaches. We have a rolling average and then a zero baseline, which just predicts zero uh, for all future time steps and all hexes. Uh, we'll go into detail about why we added this in a second. Um, we have uh, two deep learning uh, models, so a two-layer MLP and a two-layer LSTM. And then we have four graph-based approaches, uh, the more traditional sequential arrangement arrangements of graph to recurrent or recurrent to graph network work, and then the two layers that, um, that we came up with. You might note that there are uh, regression as well as uh, classification metrics listed here. And uh, that is due to the data set being really sparse. So a lot of the hexes will actually be zero in like a ma many future time steps. Um, so we could also see this problem as a binary classification task um, as to predict to whether or not uh, the hex will be undersupplied in the next couple time steps. And um, as we can see, like the zero baseline, for example, does pretty like does okay in mean absolute error and could be considered like a no effort, like a promising no effort solution. And we also further address the um, significant data balance uh, with metrics that capture missed deficits. So we have um, we filter for node activation, um, and we have we evaluate like the masked version of MAE and MSE. So we noticed that graph-based methods do outperform um, the other baselines by around six to twenty-four percent, depending on uh, which baseline, uh, which metric we are looking at. However, when comparing like RGNN, which is our approach, uh, with a more traditional approach uh, of a sequential arrangement, uh, we observe that we only lose about 1% in some metrics while gaining six to eight in others. Uh, we also note that both our methods have a more balanced um, precision recall trade-off, um, which is particularly important in data sets where the cost of false positive and false negatives um, are high. Um, and it indicates model robustness to different seasons and locations. The next data set we tested this on uh, was the COVID-19 um, open data set, which was published by Google at the end of 2022, um, and it examines the pandemic's impact. Uh, we focus on the United States, mapping connection between states um, based on whether or not they share a border. And yes, that means that Alaska and Hawaii are independent nodes that are just floating around and are not connected to the rest of the graph. Um, we studied the efficacy of a state's response um, to the health crisis by predicting the number of new infections and hospitalizations. Um, and the data set itself includes various metrics, um, such as vaccination rates, mobility trends, and lockdowns. And then we added uh, population statistics, um, like, for example, the unemployment rate um, from the U.S. Census Bureau and some healthcare performance metrics for each state. Um, again, we um, evaluate the same baselines and um, metrics. And we noticed that, um, again, RGNN um, outshines other, including uh, an LSTM approach um, in terms of mean um, absolute error, um, average displacement error, and final displacement error, by a, by a, and the precision, actually, by around 18%. Um, LSTM does have a well-balanced um, precision recall, which kind of indicates that for this particular data set, um, a simpler approach that does not particularly involve graphs actually uh, would be sufficient. Um, and that, yeah, okay. Um, 
we also tested these approaches on um, methods with like denser and more multimodal data sets. Uh, while I'm not going to cover them now, I'm happy to go into more detail about them later. So we um, introduce a more fundamental combination of graph with recurrent neural networks uh, for predicting spatial temporal dynamics more efficiently and accurately than traditional sequential arrangements. Um, while uh, RGNN offers like a versatile framework, they often require extensive customization depending on the data set we are um, applying them to. Um, and the combination of graph and recurrent neural networks does actually um, increase computational demand significantly. Um, and this is uh, this complexity is especially challenging in scenarios where like rapid data processing would be required. Okay. Uh, moving on to the third contribution, um, it's the variational autoencoder framework uh, that integrates graph-based representations with time sequence models uh, to efficiently capture spatial temporal dynamics among interactive agents. Uh, while this architecture does train a motion prediction model, oh, sorry, just a prediction model, uh, the work focuses on model interpretability and out of distribution generalizability. So variational autoencoders, or VAEs for short, are generative models that excel at learning deep uh, representations um, of a data set in an unsupervised manner. Uh, they do so by encoding data into a latent space and then reconstructing uh, the original input uh, from that space. Um, the architecture for VAE is split into two main components. We have an encoder, which captures the data underlying structure and maps it into a latent space. And then the decoder, which uh, take those, takes those latent representations and attempts to reconstruct the original input. This process is not just about uh, compression, it's about understanding the data in a way that enables the model to generate new data samples that mimic the original data set. Uh, this is a representation of our encoder architecture. Uh, our model infers dynamic interaction graphs in a latent space and augment, uh, augmented with um, edge features that characterize these interactions. Uh, we aim to enhance the model interpretability and out of distribution generalizability uh, by then uh, disentangling this latent representation. And those are noted here by capital E. So disentanglement refers to the process where a model learns to separate or disentangle uh, the underlying factors of a variation within the data set, uh, which means that we're trying to identify individual features that contribute to differences uh, within the inputs. The main goal is to have the learned representation be more uh, meaningful and actually orthogonal. And models that achieve good disentanglement uh, tend to uh, be more robust in changes to input and generalize better. We introduced two types of disentanglement. Uh, first, we have restricted labeling, which matches the distribution of an observed sample X with a subset of ground truth features that are denoted here by SI. Um, so it's basically regression on a subset of features that are being learned. And then we have pair matching, which is an unsupervised approach that operates on pair data. So we have two samples, X and X prime, um, with a subset of common feature values. Uh, this approach is also often um, considered to be weakly supervised because while it does not rely on, on like on a subset of like ground truth features, SI, um, it does correlate with its indices. And although various strategies exist, uh, for its implementation. Um, this method typically involves sampling twice from the encoder and then equating a subset of their features by averaging their differences. Um, in our case, because we are sampling trajectories, uh, we already have multiple steps and multiple samples from the encoder. Uh, so instead of sampling two trajectories, we just chose to um, average the difference of a subset of features within the whole trajectory, thereby rendering some of the features virtually static. Okay, so uh, moving on to experiments. This is the NBA data set. Um, it features the trajectories of um, all 10 players and a basketball. Uh, each trajectory has 50 time steps at a frequency of three hertz, which leads to an, a prediction horizon of roughly 3.6 uh, seconds. Sorry. Um, the right figure shows uh, the trajectories for different models. Um, so we have the uh, dashed gray lines to be the ground truth 
uh, blue and green line speed of predictions for home and visiting team respectively, and the pink purplish one uh, being the prediction for basketball. Um, we do note that our approach demonstrates a smaller deviation from the ground truth uh, compared to DNRI or LSTM. Okay. Um, and then we note that um, when we look at the table on the right, um, that our method outperforms the strongest baseline, which in this case is the NRI, by roughly 25% when the edge features are just learned, and it goes up to 45% when these edge features are further disentangled into um, dynamic and static features. Um, in this case, because an NBA game does not have a ground truth graph, we uh, obviously used the unsupervised approach of pair matching. Okay. Um, the second data set I will be presenting is um, the CMU motion capture database. Uh, this data set includes recordings um, that track movements across 31 different joints in a subject's body. And um, in a compared to overview, we noticed that, um, again, our method outperforms uh, the next best baseline, which is the NRI by roughly 28%. Um, and how method, especially when we actually include pair matching or disentanglement, uh, improves the out-of-distribution um, uh, performance. Uh, what we mean by out-of-distribution here is we did train the data set, uh, we did train the model on a data set of uh, just one subject walking um, and then tested it on uh, the recordings of other subjects, so it might be taller, longer limbs, whatever, um, performing different movements that would include running, hiking, and uh, jumping, playing basketball, and dancing. Um, so these findings are also reflected qualitatively in the figure to the right, where the gray skeleton is the ground truth and the blue ones are the predictions. And we do notice that we match the long-term prediction uh, much closer than uh, DNRI and LSTM especially around the legs and feet. This is where it gets fun. Um, disentanglement introduced a new level of expressivity. Uh, these are examples of some learned features. You might notice that feature one and feature seven are static. So the hue and color or like color of the edge doesn't change throughout the movement, while feature 20 and 31 are dynamic. Um, overall, the learned features do seem to correlate with some distinct relations. So for example, feature one strongly correlates the upper body to the front leg, uh, suggesting that it might encode uh, like weight shifting while a step is taken. Uh, feature seven uh, encodes or like strongly relates all extremities, so um, hands and feet, uh, and weakly links more stationary relations, uh, suggesting that it's encoding a variance in distance. So for example, while your shoulders aren't really changing in distance uh, while you're walking, uh, your feet kind of like, increase and decrease like a pendulum while you take each step. And um, while the dynamic features, so 20 and 31, are less uh, like distinctly interpretable, we do know that they are complementary. So the dark edges in 20 are light in 31. Uh, to summarize, we merge uh, graphical networks with variational autoencoders for um, a more efficient spatial import analysis. Uh, the disentanglement of uh, the edge feature space improves interpretability and out of distribution generalizability. And um, despite these enhancements, this method actually faces uh, some scalability issues. Um, the uh, effectiveness of disentanglement seems to be reduced as the network grows in size. Um, and complexity, and therefore maybe some more um, research needs to be done in like this realm to see how we can make uh, like the features more interpretable in uh, larger graphs. Uh, okay, so moving on to the uh, fourth and last contribution, um, we merge graph neural networks with reinforcement learning, more specifically with uh, deep Q learning. Uh, we train a GNN to map the value function. That means that we take as input the graphical representation of a um, problem state and then output the expected rewards for all available actions from that state. Um, in, this, in this work, we use reinforcement learning uh, to solve combinatorial optimization problems. Okay, uh, combinatorial optimization, which from now on I will be referring as CO because it is a tongue twister. 
um, is about making the best decisions uh, from a limited set of options. So we have the decision variables, which represent our choices, an optimization function to be minimized or maximized, and a set of constraints that our uh, proposed solution has to respect. So um, we tested our approach on the flexible job shop problem, which I'll be introducing now. Imagine you have a factory with a uh, with, some, with several machines and a job to be uh, and a bunch of jobs to be completed. Each job consists of multiple tasks um, that need to be processed in this very specific order, and each task can only be done on a specific on a specific subset of machines. So it might look like this, and this, and so on and so forth. Um, the goal is to find the most efficient schedule that minimizes the completion time of all your tasks, um, which is also called the deep makes man. It is a complex scheduling problem that is most commonly encountered in production and manufacturing environments. To compare performance across different methods, um, we evaluate the optimality gap. Here, C min is uh, the make span for uh, our post solution. C star is the optimal make span. And um, this metric can also be referred to as relative error. Um, the figure on the right, the figures on the right show the learning curves for our Q learner, and we notice that around epoch 150, we have sudden jumps in the success rate and the training awards. And uh, these can be attributed to uh, the timestamp when the Q learner transitions from gridlocking itself to actually producing uh, feasible solutions. And because the optimality gap can only be evaluated for feasible solutions, that explains why this curve, um, this one. Uh, kind of like starts around the same epoch and then decreases sharply um, as the Q-learner, um, as a solver, just improves on its general strategy. After the Q-learner um, has been trained, uh, it can be used to solve problems of any size. And as such, it could actually be viewed as a type of meta-learning um, that is enabled by um, just processing the graphical representation of a problem size, which is not limit uh, graphical representation of a problem, which is not limited uh, to its to its problem size. Um, we compare against uh, meta heuristics, which are kind of like industry standard, and we find that we are approaching its performance. Um, but it's important to note that the meta heuristic does have a polynomial dependence on problem size, while we only have a logarithmic one. And when we compare our approach to ScheduleNet, which is another deep learning reinfor deep reinforcement learning uh, model, uh, which actually evaluates the um, the normal job shop problem, so not the flexible version of it, which is a si slightly simpler version of it, um, we do beat its performance um, while also um, only using one sixth of its parameters. So we are much lighter and train much faster. Um, so this last contribution actually uh, kind of like signified a shift from like data analysis and prediction towards more like dynamic decision making by introducing um, a, a graph based version of Q learning. Um, we represent CO problems as a graph and then search for um, a possible solution as if they were an MDP. Um, and we do so by using um, a graph neural network um, as a Q learner. Um, yeah, so while our graph learner outperforms traditional like heuristic solvers in efficiency and scalability, the solution it generates are still approximate and therefore uh, some more refinement like could be done here. Um, okay, so I've been talking for a while, but it's only like three more slides. Um, so here's what we've talked about so far. Uh, we have developed um, an improved random of complexity uh, bounds for graph neural networks. Um, these bounds are size independent and adaptable to various uh, network architectures and uh, different loss functions. Uh, next, we introduced um, a novel architectures to integrating graph with recurrent neural networks uh, for um, analyzing spatial temporal data. Um, it, this our approach like more effectively effectively captures uh, spatial dynamics alongside temporal processing, and then. Uh, we also developed a GNN-based variation autoencoder, which enhances motion prediction and uh, exhibits superior performance in out-of-distribution scenarios and just small interpretability. And then lastly, we covered uh, graph neural networks within the framework of reinforcement learning, specifically for combinatorial optimization tasks 
and uh, our method approaches performance of state-of-the-art solutions while only scaling uh, logarithmically with problem size. These are the respective papers for each of my contributions, and they also correspond to the chapters in my thesis. And um, before I wrap up, I would like to propose some future research directions um, that continue kind of like the spirit of what we just talked about. Um, so deepening our investigation of integrated like GNN, RNN architecture, we could look at more of like a theoretical evaluation uh, for convergence and robustness, for example. Uh, we could also look at other cross-disciplinary um, integrations such as diffusion models or NLPs. Those are pretty hot right now. Um, and then staying within the context of reinforcement learning, uh, we could be looking at more like sampling techniques, uh, for example, important sampling uh, to help address like scalability issues and improve the processing on large scale graph. Uh, and actually this last one is what I'm currently working on uh, with um, HRI and hope to wrap up um, before I graduate. Uh, 